behalf of SVT College, it is my privilege to have you here over there, over for this webinar. So I request Taha to please play the video of our college. So we'll give you a glimpse of our college. Afterwards, we can start with your sessions. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Preeti Vajpayee and architect Kabir Vajpayee. They are, they are architects based in New Delhi with the experience on the develop, uh, developing learning environment of school and preschool in rural as well as urban areas. Dr. Preeti Vajpayee is an urban planner and an academician also. They both co-founded Vinay Vinayas in 1996 to undertake the innovation application oriented uh, research and design, uh, building capacity and provided policy support. They have been listed in the, 30, uh, in the 32 great stories of change in Indians in, 19, uh, in 2009. Architect Kabir Vajpayee was recognized as a social entrepreneur in uh, Pro Vinas provided advice to the government consultancy in UNICEF, UNESCO, UNDP, the World Bank, Gates, Aga Khan Foundation, Rajiv Gandhi Foundation, Hardko, the part of several non-profit and private institutions on the matter related to education, early childhood care, and building design, conservation, tourism, training, conservation policies, etc. Apart from research and design, Vinayas also constructed, conducted workshops and training programs for the administrators, architects, engineers, teachers, and masons in participating uh, participative designs and constru construction practices. One, uh, one of the key developed Vinayas has been Bala uh, building as well as learning aid, which is gradually transforming schools and Anganwadis across the India now. This is my opportunity opportunity to welcome you, sir and ma'am. The platform is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bansuri. Thank you so much for inviting us. And uh, I think we are both grateful for uh, being here and sharing uh, part of learning that we have had. Uh, and I think we are grateful to all of you, uh, you know, at the Institute, the principal, Pallavi ma'am, and her entire team, uh, Shailesh, and Taha, and all of you, and Bonsari. Uh, uh, what, what we would like to share today with you is one of the dimensions of essence in architecture, 
and uh, this essence we feel is uh, coming from uh, the childhood and uh, this essence is essentially when we are trying to develop spaces for children uh, whether they are very young children uh, in the preschool age or those who are coming in the school going age uh, it is very critical and if you look across the world uh, wherever in some of the most so called developed nations they have invested heavily into the childhood and they have done this across at different levels and uh, if you want to look at canada you want to look at finland you want to look at japan you want to look at most of the countries across the world who are seen to be well equipped uh, well developed in so many uh, indicators you will find that they had also done a good investment in in the development of spaces for children and the resources they allocated for children and architecture was certainly one of them now india is of course a difficult country in many ways but it's also a very diverse rich country in many other ways uh, what we are going to share with you today uh, in next perhaps an hour or so is uh, a dimension that we thought is critical and important is uh, uh, you know of working with schools and more deliberately with government schools and anganwadis and this is a long journey and evolving journey and some of the glimpses of that will be visible uh, it's not a ready made product it is something which has you know kind of evolved over a period of time we made several mistakes we we learned from that and we engaged and and, and that's how the journey still continues and uh, so so basically this is what it is and we are going to share with you one of the ideas which has been spread out uh, across uh, for schools in anganwadi which is building as learning aid uh, this particular idea is uh, not one idea actually it is a collection of several ideas and a glimpse of that will be uh, visible today uh, let me show you uh, and uh, a small video clip this is from chatisgarh and this is uh, a window which has been modified in an existing anganwadi in a tribal area of chatisgarh in bastar region and this is a government anganwadi in which the lower child accessible portion has been modified using the local craft using the local skills and frugal resources it is one may say not architecture but actually at the core it is because it is supporting the child development process and in the process it is supporting eye hand coordination it is supporting the concentration if you could look at the eyes of the child the concentration with which she was trying to do it a sense of accomplishment the fine motor movement of the hand and the wrist which is all critical and important for early childhood development now <clears throat> in this particular picture that you see right now you see the mason who created it you see the anganwadi worker who was part and parcel of the process you see that child and that window the lower portion of which has been modified which was at the child accessible height uh, so um, you know our journey began uh, sometime in 1995 when as very young professionals we were uh, doing a project called lok jumbesh uh, program in rajasthan where our uh, mandate was to uh, upgrade and repair 60 uh, rural schools and that was our first exposure to you know rural india because uh, we were born and brought up all over education in urban areas so what we saw there was extremely disturbing you know school after school we saw that uh, uh, the environment was very very um, you know unfriendly towards a child we saw barren outdoor spaces uh, nothing to engage or stimulate the child um, all the teaching learning materials if you can look at the classroom you know it is uh, such a dull space to be in all the teaching learning materials uh, that is you know usually given uh, it was usually given to the teachers remained locked in the cupboards um, because you know it was taken uh, out only during some kind of an inspection because teacher had a fear that it will get lost or things like that so uh, a child had nothing to you know play with or engage with and um, 
we also realize that many a times you know child might be there in the school but the teacher is not available because of some reasons like she, she might be engaged in the census duty or election duty or things like that so imagine you know coming to a school like this you know nothing absolutely nothing to um, uh, you know uh, which is which is which can be called child friendly and uh, though our mandate was to repair and upgrade the school but uh, you know we were deeply troubled by what we saw and we often wondered that as architects can we do something for the children in school uh, which will make the environment you know more friendly for them but uh, uh these were uh, we we were quite clueless uh, at that point of time and we toyed with certain ideas which which came to our mind uh and we were you know just starting our experiment when uh, this uh, okran blast happened and the project you know the uh, funding stopped and the project stopped suddenly um but we wanted to explore that how uh, you know environments uh, can be made more Uh, relevant for the child and um, so we continued our research for many years and got a funding from unicef um, and uh, and the and you know many people in this research it was an interdisciplinary research in which many uh, many many people teachers and environmentalists and mathematicians and physicists many people were part of that research and uh, today what we are going to show to you um, is uh, out of you know that research you know, and many people have helped in that so we are indebted to all of them profoundly uh and uh, over the years we have worked extensively on child friendly schools and anganwadis on various aspects like playscapes uh the wash the water and sanitation hygiene aspects of schools um how schools can be made more sustainable uh and uh, but for want of time you know today's lecture will essentially focus on the idea of bala or building is learning aid so you see these two pictures in front of you and uh, i'm sure you can notice the difference between the two uh on the left and on the right so there is a physical transformation which is taking place here because these photographs are actually from the same school the same classroom and in fact the same wall the difference is about 3 months and these 3 months and this is a government school uh, right in the heart of delhi right next to the india gate uh, it's a new delhi municipal corporation school there and uh, the transformation here is not <laughs> physical because i mean some of you who would have engaged or would be engaging with the government system would understand that there excuse is a excuse me kabir kabir please excuse me i think your screen is not seen screen is not visible Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no visible. Sir, visible. Screen is visible. Uh, visible, ma'am. Okay. Done, done, done. Okay. So, the uh, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, schools, the government schools specifically, you will find that there is uh, an administrative uh, mechanism. So there will be administrators who are taking decisions, who are adults. You will have uh, technical people who could be architects and engineers who are again adults. Then you have the school teachers who are also adults. You have the contractor and their people like mason, uh, a carpenter, electrical person. Uh, you know, all of them, plumber. They are all adults. As a result, the child's perspective have very little space in what we are trying to do. If you don't notice the difference, and if you ask an educationist, what is the difference between the two uh, visuals? The difference is that the first one doesn't allow the child so comfortably to come near. It is about the authority of a teacher's space. The second one says, "Yes, you are welcome. Come in. You are also a part of this learning process." And I think this attitudinal shift is the first most critical point to introduce bala in a system, and that is exactly what we have been trying to do. uh when we are trying to make any transformational difference so it's about child friendliness to bring that attitude in the system and its processes uh so um secondly you know uh, bala is about uh, facilitating natural behavior of children you know children um have certain tendencies and certain behavior and many at times just because we are unaware of the significance of those behaviors that children typically exhibit 
we tend to stop them midway and uh, and it it is you know research shows that it is harmful uh, for their overall development for example most of the children you know uh, of grade around grade 1 2 or maybe younger um, have a tendency to scribble on the wall and furniture and everywhere and uh, we most often you know uh, we ask them to not do this and inspect uh, in, and many children might get punished for doing it also but again uh, when we uh, studied you know about more about behavior of children we re realize that it is a very important part of their growth because their body is getting prepared to uh, for writing readiness their muscles gross motor muscles you know fine motor muscles how to uh, you know uh, uh, how to have a grip on pencil and then uh, to be able to write uh, so this scribbling is a very important part of uh, uh, their natural behavior and therefore but often we do not give you know any provision or give it due respect and our uh, environments are not uh, really seen from these perspectives so in bala we have really tried to understand uh, the uh, significance of uh, natural behavior of children and how it can be incorporated in the design just one example is this that even furniture can be made more child friendly as you can see uh, the furniture on the right uh, it has a writable surface rather than having normal uh, timber or a, a, you know any kind of uh, furniture uh, the sun mica or the finishing that has been used is writable and they can write the edges are rounded uh, thus, uh, the height, as you can see, is more related to the anthropometrics of children. So th this, you know, even the furniture can be made uh, more child friendly or anything in the school for that matter. So you can also small uh, notice small other differences like sharp corners and edges in the first one and the rounded ones in the next one. Now, these small details are very critical because children run. They, you know, they expedite their energy in different ways. And it's very important that we take attention to those details and bring it to the notice of those who take the decisions around procurement of furniture and stuff like that. So uh, this is an example of uh, you know a broken floor of a corridor in a school, a government school. Uh, now, the point is that very often you have such spaces which are there, and they don't inspire any learning activity. They don't inspire a child to be there. I mean, this will also hurt children in so many ways when they're running or doing any activities. The point is, now there are resources and funds available with the government to repair and augment them. But often the repair process could be just a civil work driven uh, kind of an approach where it is, uh, you know, you lay a new floor, maybe using a very nice looking tile or stuff like that. But can it be done more innovative, innovatively and creatively, where it is not just a floor, but it also becomes a learning resource? And we are talking about these resources also because all said and done, we have very high population. And we, whatever we may be boasting wherever, the fact of the matter is there are a large number of children who cannot buy even the piece of stationery. In, in, in that situation, if we are really talking about development, we are talking about all kinds of indicators, we need to strengthen education in multiple ways. And one of the potential we see here is architecture, because it's a space with which a child engages in so many ways. So even the floor could be done creatively. And that's an example here that you do a creatively done floor. This is a floor in front of class one and two. And it is basically looking into the learning possibilities, uh, which is linked to their curriculum. So it's not something which, an, which is an architect's fancy, but something which is very much linked to the learning uh, process. Let us see these two examples. I mean, I'm sure you have had, uh, you, you understand landscape architecture. But if I ask you a simple question, the two pictures that you see, which one would you prefer to have in a school? And uh, the, I mean, it's so evident that, uh, you know, the one on the left doesn't inspire anything. But if you look at it, the one on the right, it actually invites you to do so many things. And very often, the engagement of the school managements, whether it's government or private, would be to have very nice looking, good looking, you know, beautiful, uh, uh, appearing, visually pleasing kind of stuff. Now, this is an adult's perspective. The moment you actually look at the same tree or the vegetation from a child's perspective, it changes because it has 
a very vibrant kind of a perspective and i think that is exactly what is required when we are looking at the landscape from the chais perspective what you see here is an example where you have low branching trees gujarat has enough of varieties even in mangoes which allow you to have this you have low i mean it allows you to engage with the landscape in so many different ways which is not possible in the photograph that you see on your left so i think it's very important to see not just the physical space but also the landscape from that perspective uh, <clears throat> there are large number of schools which have a open space but which, which is barren and these are examples some of them would even be valid for gujarat uh, in some remote locations uh, rajasthan maharashtra places where you will find that it's a extreme kind of uh, you know open space but not really creating uh, enough child friendly environments in that now even that could be transformed with frugal resources uh, to a very exciting something which is addressing all the domains of development whether it is cognitive whether it is physical whether it is a social emotional domain or if it is aesthetical domain and we'll just show you an example of that through this small film now this is a school uh, which is located uh, elsewhere uh, this is uh, in fezabad and what you will see here is a whole range of examples of how discarded tires can be used creatively now this idea is originated by a person who is no more jimmy jolly and uh, he visited india several times and he created many of these he was a child development professional and that's the beauty of you know engaging with different kinds of professionals with different disciplines that you learn so much and this is exactly what he created the see the range of situations the settings which have been created not every child is physical some of them may like to observe some of them might like to negotiate some of them may like to collaborate and so you see that you are trying to address all these domains of development and not just the physical there are certain rights which cannot be used alone you need support from others there might be rights which allow i mean we give which make you fearful to start with but then you have to overcome that fear so you you know you actually start negotiating within yourself how do you overcome the fear for instance this one and that is that is the beauty of uh, you know this whole thing that it lets you engage with the physical environment in so many ways and that is exactly that age of childhood all about so a tire playground is not just a physical development space but it's a space which allows you to be creative creative in thinking creative in using materials it allows you to engage in so many different ways uh, with the material which is around social emotional cognitive uh, aesthetical all all of it uh, as you can see so it's also about sensory development where you engage with multiple senses and uh, you know it's about engaging in so many different ways of soiling your hands and everything and that's exactly the way the learning takes place through this kind of a space actually play is a very very non threatening way of learning uh, so much you know when the child is playing with water there's so much of cognitive development also that is taking place you know concepts like what is sinking what is floating uh, the weight of water you know how it uh, how it takes shape and so many things which are part of a uh, later uh, you know uh, science you know but uh, all this can be very through play Uh, it can come in in a very very um, non threatening way so uh, we are going to show you a small text on your screen and uh, we are going to ask you to 
you know, just remember it. And you have about uh, 15 seconds to do that. So you just remember it, the text which is written there. Now I'm going to take off this and show you something else. This has the same font, the same color, the same uh, letters, I would say. But uh, I now give you only three, four seconds to remember this. The point is, very often what we are doing is this. We are not creating spaces. We are not giving them experiences which are meaningful from the child's perspective. We are all always imposing it from the adult's perspective. And I think it is very important that we change that. So Bala is about creating meaningful experiences for children in whatever environment they are in. It is irrespective whether they are in a rural area or a tribal area or a most remote area or uh, on the top of a hill or on the side of a seashore or in the desert and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so there are two levels of interventions which Preeti will explain. So developing Bala in whether you are doing it in an Aganwadi or any kind of uh, school, there are essentially two levels of interventions. One is that um, you identify the various spaces uh, uh, of a school which can be used for you know uh, creating these teaching learning experiences which are very playful in nature. And typically, we have a tendency to uh, you know consider classroom or the playground as a main setting for learning but children learn everywhere they do not learn only within the four walls of a classroom so it's important to you know consider each space of a, of a school as a resource whether it is backyard or a corridor or even terrace or any incidental space uh, it can be uh, used to create uh, meaningful experiences for children and secondly, it is uh, also important to identify the various built elements in these spaces, whether it is uh, a floor or wall or doors or windows or even boundary wall or even trees, seats, fan, furniture, anything, you know, and uh, how that can be used to create a child friendly experience. Um, this is uh, what uh, essentially has been our uh, sort of journey to you know, explore what are the possibilities. Just to explain what we mean by uh, Bala settings in a space. So uh, suppose we take the example of a terrace and terraces typically uh, remain very underused uh, spaces in, in any school in most of the buildings. And uh, uh, but in uh, in this particular school, you know, many things have been done on the terrace so that it becomes a setting for many child friendly experiences. Like there is a setting to play with water in a shallow pool. So it's a safe thing, uh, uh, but a lot of fun. Yeah? Children always want to play with water. And also it has an additional advantage of, uh, you know, uh, controlling the insulation. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, there is a, there are settings to write and draw on the floor dot board you know so a lot of activities we typically don't use uh, floors for writing activities whereas children have this natural behavior of uh, engaging with floor a lot so a lot of things can be done on the floor also and uh, uh, again um, uh, you know different kind of games uh, uh, can be incorporated added in the floor like here ludo and chess these both have been made from the broken tiles and uh, and they are placed in the outdoors because outdoors places are mostly very much more accessible to the uh, children you know than they if if it is a normal stationary kind of a um, uh, you know chess board or a, a ludo then it would typically remain logged in a teacher's almira but if it is incorporated in some public space of a school, then it is more accessible to children for a lot of um, access, uh, you know, uh, games and um, and uh, and again, uh, you know, uh, a hopscotch frame and things like that. So, uh, what uh, you know, we try to do is that for f in any space, you know, there is a lot of hidden potential, and we try to bring that out in a very uh, for a very child friendly setting. And so there are some uh, other examples also. And I would like to mention here that the model of implementation that uh, we follow for 
uh, Bala um, in different states. You know, we have worked extensively with many state governments um, uh, and with support of UNICEF in some places. Otherwise, also. And the uh, model that we follow is that we ourselves do not go to each uh, you know, village for implementation because it is just not possible. We cannot uh, be having that kind of outreach. You know, there are uh, in in uh, Tamil Nadu alone, there are, you know, 45,000 plus schools. We uh, are a huge nation. Um, what we do is that we typically train the Sir Siksha Abhiyan, which is now called Samagra Siksha Abhiyan, engineers and teachers towards creation of more child-friendly setting because this is a more sustainable process because if, if these people are working in, in the rural schools, the ownership is much more uh, and, you know, uh, and their, their creative potential is also utilized. And the uh, whole thing, you know, if there is a maintenance issue which crops in later, uh, they can handle it. So all that that you would be seeing mostly is, uh, you know, a, a result of training of these teachers and engineers, and it has been implemented by them. And as you can see here, that again, play is a very, very, like I have told you, it's a very non-threatening way of holistic child development. Uh, but play needs are very diverse. Usually, we focus on uh, uh, on when sports. we say play, then we focus on sports like cricket and you know basketball and things like that. Uh, but uh, you know, children, uh, some children may like you know games which uh, which involve mental skills like chess and you know, while others may prefer open-ended games of chance, you know, like Ludo. Uh, like snakes and ladder and things like that, while some may prefer very, very open-ended play, like playing with water, playing with sand and things like that. So it's very important uh, to provide, uh, the, to cater to the all the diverse needs of uh, children in play settings also, because play becomes a, a set, uh, you know, medium for a lot of holistic development i mean language development is taking place mathematical development is taking place you know they are understanding many concepts their social emotional um, development is taking place because you know negotiating a loss or a victory and expressing their emotions in a socially acceptable ways all this is also very important we should not be seeing schools only as settings for cognitive development, only for academic learning. You know, uh, there is so much more that happens in school, and as uh, through architecture, we can foster development in uh, all the domains. Okay, so uh, you know, we worked extensively with the child development professionals, educationists, and others who are hardcore into education itself, and decided that yes what is it that the architecture and the space can bring in this whole process of learning and uh, one of the things we understood while interacting with many of them was that architecture is the space is the, is the space around whether it is at home whether it is in the neighborhood or in the school uh, or in the anganwadi wherever it is and if we program it very carefully you know, in a manner of and by understanding the developmental stages of children, we can create something very meaningful and, you know, create something very meaningful in their process of learning. So just to illustrate this example, you know, for instance, if a child wants to learn uh, Archimedes principle at the age when they come to grade eight or so, which is something about science and physics, unless they have seen and experienced something in their childhood, what floats, what sinks, you know that understanding would be very very theoretical it won't be embedded inside deeply so what is it that the architecture can do and that is exactly where we can program multiple experiences and just to give you an example a child let us say a child is going from home to a school and enters a school like this and uh, we'll just see some examples of what kind of experiences can be subtly programmed and this needs an interdisciplinary process. Architects alone cannot take this call. So like you see a visual or whatever, and you also have some water there, a child moves further, and you have some other experience. And these are not uh, kind of telling the child, learn, 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 or, you know, it's not a lesson plan in that sense, but actually it is very subtly programmed to provide certain experiences of 
all senses in different ways. So, you know, this is an example where, you know, a child is moving uh, through this building. Uh, this is, uh, you know, and in the, in the process of movement, there are these multiple settings through which they engage. And uh, so they might be moving in a corridor, they might be entering into a building, they might be by the side of a pool, for instance, uh, and, you know, engaging with water or, uh, uh, you know, doing something else, uh, maybe in the outdoors, uh, it could be that tire kind of a thing, or it could be sand play. Uh, it could be also uh, engaging with the kitchen garden or a nutrition garden, where you know you you actually engage in the learning process of how the plants are growing, what is happening to them, and what is it that you can do to make them grow efficiently and better, and, and so on. And similarly, they could you know move around into different kinds of spaces. Uh, where they could be playing or engaging in different ways uh, and further they could be uh, even going uh, into other spaces where they could be performing for instance or doing a group activity which is about emotional development and so on now these experiences as we are just going through some of them the glimpses of some of them are fundamentally about looking at a child as a whole and not just as an empty uh, you know kind of a pot uh, to be poured with knowledge and filled with knowledge. So architecture can actually engage at a very different level. And that is what we are trying to explore through this process of Bala. Uh, we would, I, I would also like to share with you that this is an unending process for us. I mean, we have been engaged with Bala for past so many years, more than 20 years now. And yet we find every time a new layer which gets unfolded for us and to, to take it forward. So. Uh, you know, these these are different kinds of experiences that a child, as a child is moving, uh, engages with, and they are certainly programmed, and then they are linked to the development process, where, as the child grows, would have had certain experiences which are critical for the overall development. And I think this is, in a way, you know, programming your building with the essence uh, of childhood in, in, in the architecture itself. So this is an example of uh, uh, of that, and uh, uh, but moving further, uh, we will uh, see some examples of these settings and resources uh, for schools in different ways. For instance, this is a floor. It could have been a normal floor, but this is having a, some something which is a writable surface in a circular form, and this is something which can be used in so many multiple ways by children. All kinds of activities for different subjects. It could be for certain play activities and so on. Uh, there could be a number line on the floor, which is, uh, uh, you know, about uh, understanding the ascending numbers for very young children. But at the same time, as you grow older, uh, you know, you could be in grade five or six or seven, where you could be talking about positive numbers and negative numbers. The same number line engages with you differently. Actually, uh, children learn, uh, you know, the uh, when, when we study how children learn one of the very important theories is that children learn uh, when the engagement is multiple sensory so if you just um, these number lines uh, uh, offer uh, you the experience of kinesthetics of moving forward for say addition and moving backwards for subtraction and that uh, that that uh, when you uh, you know relate a very theoretical concept with kinesthetics i think it makes uh, more sense, uh, you know, so even number operations you know, for normal numbers in, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, lower grades, but as you go up higher, so for integers, negative numbers and things like that, the same um, resource can be used. And uh, we, uh, after a lot of discussion, you know, most of these resources are very, very open-ended. So it can be used in multiple ways and usually located in a setting which allows multiple use by different grades. Uh, so, uh, Scales, you know, measurement is something. I mean, and there, there have been studies even amongst private schools where I think, uh, you know, they started to find out what all have children learned in mathematics uh, across years. I'm not even talking about government schools, but uh, even there they found that, you know, measurement was one of the areas which was a problematic area. I mean, even if I ask someone today, can you tell me the dimension of the room where you're sitting? You may have multiple answers. 
Now, it is very important that we engage the child with that right from the very early age, not because we want to make them as architects or engineers, but also because in daily life, you need to know what is the measurement. And that's very critical. What you see here are two, three examples. For instance, for very young, young children, you know, one centimeter, two centimeter, 10 centimeter doesn't make any sense. For them, their body is the measure. So one can start with a very early age, you know, with something like uh, a palm, a palm of a child. So 10 palms, 10, 20 palms and so on. And then it can graduate further. For instance, what you see here, here are the government school benches which have been screen printed with a scale. Now this is scale is for measurement because these children may not actually have a scale at home or in their compass box. They cannot afford to buy it. But what architecture can provide is a, a bench or something where they can measure things and experience it. What you see on the other example is a long jump space and a scale is embedded here. This is again an example from within Gujarat. Uh, another example of, uh, so you know, the, the essential part in this is that you give concrete experiences to children. And these concrete experiences are possible through the planning and the detailing of the architectural space that we design. And I think that is the, the value that we can add from architecture in the very process of learning for children. And, <clears throat> Uh, these are examples. What you see here is an example. The one on the right is from Karnataka, I think, where they had a good school. They did not require any modification. But on the left, it was a new building which was coming up. So a door angle protector. And I remember from my own childhood in my school when the angle concept was introduced, uh, you know, sometime I think in grade four or five. Uh, I was confused what it is. It never came out from the textbook to the real world for a long while. But the moment you actually show what is an angle in the real world, it makes a huge difference. And I think the moment then a child even opens a textbook and it swings so many angles, they are able to see that angle is actually in the real life. What we are trying to do here is to make a writable surface along with the door shutter, which also acts like an angle protector where you don't have a so you have diverse situations. So for instance, the one on the right, which is from a government school in Karnataka, they had a good enough floor. So they use road paint and uh, mixed with different kinds of pigments to make something on the floor, uh, like an angle protector. Now, this is very critical because children actually learn better if their learning is based on their previous experiences. And we are trying to generate those experiences when they actually get into the nitty gritties in the mathematics. Uh, you know, you could have things in optics. So you could use the uh, rainwater pipe periscope. This was actually in Gandhinagar, the one you see on the left uh, in, in a government school in Gandhinagar. Uh, what you see on the right is just turning, uh, you know, the acrylic or the polycarbonate sheet with mirror polish to give you different kind of experiences in optics. Uh, there in, is, yeah. in uh, you know, this example is uh, from a school in Kashmir. And uh, we realize that uh, in most of the rural uh, schools, I mean, there are there are no stationary shops uh, nearby, uh, and even simple uh, teaching uh, learning resource like a map uh, would be very very difficult to procure. You know, things we take for granted in urban settings, uh, most of the times, they are totally missing uh, from a uh, from a rural school. So uh, even these things, you know, like if uh, this is this example is from Kashmir, so the, it had a glazed window, and if uh, resources can be um, created for teaching and learning using this uh, uh, this uh, glazed window, then you know we have tried to use that also, just uh, so that uh, children have access to um, these kind of resources. Lot lot many resources can be generated using this technique. And we all know that this is the topo approach of doing things. So we all know it. Uh, different kind of it. Typically, we give only a plain, uh, you know, writable surface, and that only for teachers. Uh, but uh, again, our research showed that children, you know, want to explore, um, you know, writing in many ways and many concepts. If you give a dot board of a, or a grid board, many concepts of, of syllabus, you know across different subjects 
uh, can be taught more efficiently you know the time also the time on task of teacher also increases if you have other resources like this i mean this our research showed that it can be used for many subjects and for uh, different kind of uh, activities and uh, it's uh, and one of the again learning theories says that you know learning for children is easier if learning is through um, is more activity based you know all of us know that we all of us have experienced that if you if it is a very boring lecture that happens then uh, we may not you know absorb so much but if it is through an activity so we learn much more so these kind of uh, resources uh, make that activity based learning quite possible so these grid boards they might look very very simple but teachers use it for a range of uh, uh, quizzes and uh, you know games and things like that which makes the process interesting uh, so uh, you know one of the child theory child development theory says that you have to move from near to far and familiar to unfamiliar one of the points that uh, we discovered was that it is very difficult to teach mapping through textbooks and chalkboards and i mean you will be surprised many very often when we you know would ask the teachers and the children about can you tell us which is the north direction and you know very often we would be told up there you know as if it is up in the sky and we all know that this is this is not correct because and where it is coming from it is coming from the fact that most of the maps on the walls of the classrooms are hung on a wall and the north is showing up now how do you correct this and this is what happens throughout i mean you might be surprised to what happens later so we decided that okay fine let us use this theory near to far familiar to unfamiliar so classroom is something that you know you understand you can touch feel uh, everything about it why not have a classroom map right in the classroom itself inside the classroom children can engage with that you can do it on the floor you can do it on a teacher's table and so on and then you graduate from there to the more uh, complicated things we can you know the map is a certain kind of view it is a view from the top but nobody i mean if you show a child a map of a gujarat or map of a, you know india actually suddenly in grade five. or you know uh, suddenly in grade 5 you will find that they are clueless so they would just rote learn it that this is a map of india but nobody has actually gone up to see you know rakesh sharma at some point of time had gone up there and uh, said sare jahan se acha mera bharat or something long back but how many of us have, of us have actually gone up and seen gujarat from there none of us so for children to imbibe that what is a map we need to be careful so what we have done is to graduate and i'm we are just showing you two examples here one is the example of a classroom map then graduated by this would be a map of a school and map of the community and all that happening in the same school space at different in different spaces of course and what you see on the right is from uh, junagar uh, in gujarat uh, this example uh, where it's a map of india and it is oriented exactly due north and the whole geography class is going on here uh, for grade 8 the point i'm trying to make here is that we make that learning concrete we make that learning embedded through the potential that we can explore from the physical space that we design uh, the experience of pipe phone is so much fun and this is so critical if you want to later on understand acoustics which might be there you know in uh, in the later grades uh, but uh, unless you actually go through some experience in your childhood so this is one example of how even a pipe phone uh, could be carefully planned so these were some examples of course there are many many more uh, and it's impossible to cover all of them that is not our idea also because it's a very open ended concept you know uh, people have also contributed so much uh, and so many ideas have come from others, you know, in, uh, but the whole, uh, at the core, the, uh, the concept is that you use built environment for learning. And uh, Abhi, I'm going to share um, a case study, quickly a case study. And this is again uh, from a school in Gujarat. Uh, Not which far, was, far, very far from where they are. Yes, not very far from where uh, you people are. And, um, it is in Bharuj district and the school is called Sardar Nagar Upper Primary School and it is it uh, uh, it is to grade 8 and you know the school had about 220 children of 
migrant tribal community and enrollment of retention and uh, of children was a huge problem here because all the children almost 97 percent of the children were first generation school girls their parent had never been to school they never understood to the value of education and most of them were migrant and uh, uh, lot into you know prostitution and gambling and alcoholism that was a major problem in that um, particular community so uh, no emphasis on uh, education at all and this is how the school looked earlier you know if you can see just a row of rooms with a uh, few trees and um, this is how post intervention it looked and let me again uh, you know reiterate that these uh, whatever has been done has been done by the local engineers and the teachers we just trained them you know so uh, they, it is it is at the end of the day uh, their ownership and uh, uh, towards the end if you see there is an open classroom also which has which is used for multiple activities it is again very significant from indian rural context because the money is a huge problem and many schools would have uh, you know, even if they are till grade eight, uh, they would not have enough functional rooms and they might be many schools might be running out of two or three classrooms only and they would have a multiple uh, grade system uh, because of these resource crunch and other issues. So an open classroom was made, you know, again to uh, help, you know, there are times when open classrooms are needed. A lot of landscaping uh, was done, the whole undifferentiated, you know, uh, space were created into more intimate pockets. A lot of learning resources were integrated. Landscaping was done very sensitively, keeping the child in mind. Uh, this is the another view uh, of the same school pre-intervention and if you look in this corner i mean there was not even uh, some kind of a shade uh, for child to sit in or play you know so if you can see some children are uh, sitting in this shady corner so you can imagine how this space was and uh, uh, the, this intervention went on till 2010 took about three years and uh, this is the same, uh, you know, photograph the same school, same angle, everything. And uh, a lot of changes were done by the community. Uh, this is how the, you know, corridor of the school looked earlier. And as you can see, again, nothing to stimulate the child. Uh, uh, no teaching learning resource and this is how it looks uh, now and um, uh, it, it, earlier there was no space for teachers to sit also because typically there are no funds available for staff rooms in rural schools so uh, teachers do not have any space where they can sit and work and uh, so this uh, this corner of this corridor was converted into a, a makeshift kind of a staff room and the furniture that has been made has been made out of the packaging material that comes uh, to Gujarat uh, port cities and it is uh, by and large easily available so the furniture has been made out of that at a low cost and um, this learning resources uh, all over the place have been integrated i mean this uh, this uh, this um, train that you see on the floor which we had shown earlier also it uh, relates to the curriculum of grade one and two which in which you know shape cognition and color cognition is a very important part of syllabus it has been incorporated in the floor this is how the indoor space looked earlier so it's very difficult you know if, if a room has been made in such a way that the light and ventilation is severely compromised it is impossible for, in a rural school to break it apart it's very cost prohibitive and to make it new that's not possible so um, we have worked on other uh, passive methods like uh, white were introduced so that there is a lot of reflectance of light and a lot of um, learning resources have been integrated at a uh, you know child accessible height uh, so that uh, of course like we have again uh, many, uh, many a times uh, said that these kind of resources are very important for children this is how the backyard looked earlier and as you can see you're all architecture students there is a lot of seepage uh, in the wall most probably dpc was not done a lot of water logging also and this space was totally unused uh, uh, 
um, since the time the school was made, never, you know, children used to go here because it was such a dark and dingy, uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, cluttered kind of a space. And later on, but it had one huge advantage that it, it remained in the natural shade of the building throughout the day. And uh, while the engineers were making, uh, you know, they uh, applied protection, so they decided to make it broad enough, and uh, uh, and in such a way that children can have their midday meal also uh, in the shade because earlier midday meal, uh, which is a very important program of government schools in India, that also used to happen. You know, any place children would sit in dusty you know floor and just eat it so some more dignity uh, has been given to that uh, uh, and it all uses very frugal resources not much is needed but it makes uh, you know it creates more experiences and more um, value in whatever we are doing and makes it more child centric a lot of games were also integrated in this uh, plinth protection and uh, uh, children started using this space a lot you know they would come early even before the school started because again uh, we have to remember that this is a rural setting unlike in urban school where we would have access to different kind of uh, uh, places like you know clubs or neighborhood parks or play equipment or things like that a child in a rural setting would not have access to any of these things so e the school has to you know sort of in many places play that role also and many uh, games were integrated and um, used ex extensively by students so this is how you know the school looked earlier as you can see just undifferentiated land just a row of classrooms no landscapings nothing uh, but later on um, many many intimate pockets were created and uh, many many resources were uh, you know uh, created all over the school not just in classrooms but in corridors outdoors many places nearness to nature itself is such a uh, important you know important for uh, children for their overall growth and that con disconnect to nature is also a very uh, disturbing uh, phenomena that is happening um, and uh, uh, th th these children uh, the, the, in this school it could be you know sort of reverse that trend and uh, uh, so um, when we asked children that uh, you know in earlier you know before pre-intervention what were uh, their favorite spaces so they could uh, say that only three and also if you can see in a very small geographical pocket of the school but later on the number of favorite spaces of children post intervention they went up significantly and as you can see uh, not just in uh, in a small part of the school but scattered all over the school uh, uh, the footfalls of children you know that that trend also changed significantly. Earlier, only about 20 children uh, would of the cleaning committee. So schools, because there is no person to clean the school, typically in rural settings. So children have to do that. So there is there are committees that get made. Only the children of cleaning committee would re come to school before school timing. Most of the children would reach around the time when midday meal would be served, you know, and um, uh, and for girls uh, specifically also, this was a huge problem that uh, they would not uh, be reaching the school. But post intervention, you know, the uh, the children started coming to um, uh, school earlier and uh, even by as much as one and a half hours earlier and. Uh, Teachers also, uh, you know, reported that uh, and they because a lot of outdoor settings have been made uh, for the for peer learning in the school. So many children would come early and do their homework in group uh, groups because, uh, like I've told you, most of these children are first generation school goers and there is absolutely no support at home. So many a times, many teachers, you know. Um, said that this was a problem that even if you go give them some home assignments mostly it is not done but post intervention just the space facilitated it you know that came as a surprise to us that what space can do 
this is how during school hours you know the spaces that were used earlier everything confined confined to only the classroom classroom was the only setting for teaching learning transactions uh, but later on since a lot of resources were given all over the school many activities you know are related to environment related to mathematics and other many many activities could be done in the other spaces as well so um, we all know that you know land is also one of the most expensive asset uh, that a building uh, that a school in india has i mean one of the most of course teachers teacher salaries another very very important aspect but otherwise because land prices are so high so if it is if it is more optimally used uh, more efficiently used um, uh, that's a positive indicator uh, this is how you know during recess this is what happened in this particular school that after midday meal children would uh, bunk the classes they would not stay put because uh, uh and you know so the, uh, the if we if we take the attendance the, it was highest during the midday meal time and after that there was a huge absenteeism bunking of classes uh but post intervention because there was so much to do maybe um uh, and uh, a lot of learning could be uh, more activity based so um, there's this uh, footfalls you know the children bunking the afternoon sessions that went down significantly uh and uh this space use efficiency ratio which is a um a ratio which tells that how efficiently you know different pocket of spaces are being used so space efficiency ratio uh we calculated you know it has gone up significantly for different pockets of spaces whether it is overall also a significant increase of almost 60% the front yard which which had no trees nothing you know I'll, i showed you that uh, the children sitting in one corner one shady corner uh, so uh, it was the, and it had no play equipment absolutely nothing to you know stimulate the child engage the child so uh, earlier only for assembly uh, time it was used this 13% is coming from that assembly time but now it has become a very uh, you know favorite spot and uh, there is so much to do there are outdoor libraries also there is a machan that was made by a tree house that was made many of the trees that have been planted are climbable they have a lot of um, uh, you know a lot of child friendly landscaping was done so trees that flower that uh, you know invite birds and butterflies and which have fruits and you know all colors and textures and fragrance and so many things backyard also uh, all all the spaces as you can see i wouldn't take much of your time but as you can see uh, the use has gone up so uh, you will also notice that the indoor spaces were used quite extensively initially but post intervention their use also went up but overall if you look at the whole space the indoor and the outdoor together the overall difference that you see uh, is on the left 25% was initially it went up to 81 81% and uh, uh, we uh, uh, you know self and peer group learning is a very important mode of learning in schools not all learning is through teacher directed activities only Uh, so since there are a lot of resources available all around uh, self and peer group learning instances have gone up significantly and uh, activity based teaching learning uh, has increased like uh, we would you know a teacher here is uh, you know uh, concepts of measurements um, through live examples i mean she has taken the height of two students and she's uh, telling that how how to you know subtract and all that which which we also have done it but it was the very copy based exercise you know when we did it as children so but this this experience makes it more relevant more concrete more uh, connected to their daily lives mm, and uh, pre and post duration of children in school earlier a typical school day you know 10 to 5 is other school timing so the uh, most of the children would come around midday meal and then the, then the attendance would taper down but uh, post intervention they would come early and leave very late and even during vacations uh, a typical holiday there would be no children coming to school
school but now there are many children coming to school throughout the day i mean they are playing with things even they have taken responsibilities of watering the plant of taking care of the plants in many schools each tree has been assigned to a student and uh, uh, children take care of those trees even during vacation um uh, so overall uh, just to sum up you know these are the changes these are very very important when seen um from the perspective of the goals of education that we have that we have a huge problem of retaining children in schools uh, i am not talking about urban schools i am talking about rural schools this problem for absenteeism is very high dropout is very high so um, in in the in these uh, schools you know there has been a decrease in absenteeism and earlier teachers had to pursue the parents for enrolling you know their children in the school and they had to spend a lot of time in field doing all these activities um but now uh, you know children themselves demand to be sent to the school and uh, so this enrollment in these uh, villages you know it has almost that enrollment drive there is no need uh, to conduct it now number of positive adjectives used by children to describe the school has increased children are reportedly more constructively engaged and the indicator is that uh, there is a decrease in number of reported cases of bullying fights and vandalism earlier children had uh, and there is a lot of anecdotal evidence you know the communities who are staying near the school they have told us endless stories that how early children would you know come and vandalize so many things because or just you know play around uh, create a racket or just roam around aimlessly but now since they have so much to do they Uh, stay put in the school doing all that and rate of replenishment of first aid box uh, you know this is another indicator has decreased that means um, that bullying and fights have you know gone down this is these are the statements that are coming from the teachers um there is a huge increase in ownership of the school by community earlier whatever was done there was a lot of vandalism that school faced even if a tree was planted you know but uh, they would you know pluck the tree away the tree sapling and um if anything was done they would there would be a lot of theft of school property that was reported but later on when community was also involved in this uh, pro program and they also helped and you know teachers and engineers and the community that themselves uh, did this uh, you know this this implementation which was the model so their ownership has really gone up and therefore the instances of vandalism has gone down significantly and our uh, creative potential of teachers and headmasters is really unleashed uh, we will just show you one glimpse of what uh, teachers have done in one of the schools and which is very very heartening you know this kind of uh, change that has come around in teachers so this particular video clip that we are going to show you right now it was uh, uh, and as preeti mentioned earlier that we have been training people and one of the reasons why we have been training people is that the numbers involved with government systems are very very large i mean gujarat alone for instance has about 33000 schools and with 33000 schools it is very difficult for us to actually physically reach out to all of them and it makes no sense so the model that we have chosen to work with the government is to develop the capacity of their systems and their engineers to do what needs to be done and that is a more sustainable model which sapriti also mentioned earlier so one of the things i would like to point out here in the process of taking these ideas forward in the government system is that we would conduct workshops and in one of the workshops the video clip of the tire playground that you saw earlier was also used as a resource uh, uh, material we showed that to the engineers and the school head teachers and others and when they were leaving we also gave them the clip uh, you know to carry and whatever but we also told them one small thing and we said well you can use it the way you want to use it but it might be better if you come up with a new idea which is not what you have seen here but bring your creativity and i think that is very critical that very often the government systems don't allow the creativity to really emerge and here it was possible uh, uh, you know to somehow ask them to do it and what came out was this and this is an example from uh, gir uh, near gir forest uh, 
inspired by the tire playground and what you see here is made out of uh, these wooden slats and discarded truck bearings and the entire thing has been assembled in a local workshop and uh, you know brought in here uh, so it is not just fun it is about inertia it is about uh, centripetal motion it is about centrifugal motion and all that to be experienced i myself climbed this when i photographed this and i fell down three times let me tell you so it's not easy what these three children are doing right there now the what the, the point i'm trying to make is the moment you take it to the government system the tendency is that if they like an idea they want to multiply it to 33000 schools and we have to stop them from doing that because it is not that they simply copy paste it to 33000 times it is also important that we bring the creativity of the people who are part of the system into the picture this is another example that we are going to share with you from another school and this is uh, from chandigarh upper primary school again from gujarat uh, another example where uh, uh, you know there were two three th kind of things that they did and one of them was that uh, again the same clip that you saw earlier we showed and this uh, principal uh, raj singh bhai he was there uh, in that workshop and we simply told him take this clip use it in whatever way you want but maybe you can come up with something new and what is that new that they come came up with they went and had a discussion with the children and the girls said hamare liye koi khilona nahi banate aap log ye sab ladkon ke liye banate and they came up with this tractor tire based merry go round and there is a lot of sensitivity which has gone inside it let us first see the clip and i'll tell you about the sensitivity which has gone into it it's their own creation and because they created it they own it it is not something which came from outside it is something that they themselves made if you see carefully it uses discarded motorcycle chain uh, you know to hang the whole thing and this is because we had told them that for child friendliness don't keep any sharp edges so they applied their mind and they said all the chains available in the hardware shop are not really suitable and they went to buy this not even buy they got it from the uh, you know waste shop uh, to to you know get these hero chain hero honda motorcycle chain which is and having no sharp edge and when the children are hang you know using it it won't cut their hands i mean look at the sensitivity and the detailing to which they could go and create something meaningful and useful for our children so uh, you know this is exactly what is so critical uh, the choice that we made as architects is something we want to share here is that uh, yes we are all trained as architects and uh, it's important that uh, you know we do construction wherever we can but there was a point and i would remember one gentleman who was a friend and a mentor for us uh, late vinod rena he is no more uh, we developed these ideas uh, this many of the ideas uh, at a conceptual level and when we first went to the government the doors were closed they were not open and uh, you know we went to him and we asked him that and it was five frustrating years of going to the government offices waiting for someone to you know kind of uh, give an appointment and get the appointment to talk to them and so on it did not met, it was just not materializing but he said one thing to us that you are architects and uh, in your lifetime maybe you will create 100 150 or whatever number of buildings and which is fine and which is good enough probably but if you actually work with the government it will scale to a different level and if it scales to a different level uh, you will be able to touch lives in a different way so try to work with the government system and these are the numbers these are just mind boggling as you can see uh, you know they are huge numbers uh, and they they are actually uh, you know huge numbers in many ways and i don't think as architects we can really reach out to them directly and what simple advice he said was work with the government yes it will take time it won't happen overnight but there will be people who will be able to understand and take it forward and we took his advice really seriously and that is why we were able to penetrate into the system uh, we haven't reached these figures as of now but you can very clearly see two three things one is that 87% schools are in rural areas and only 13% in the urban areas very often architects are engaging with this urban area 
The other part is that the, about 65% of school children study in government schools, and with this COVID-19, for sure, this percentage is going to go pretty high because government schools offer free education and private schools have to charge a fee. And right now, due to loss of livelihood, it is not possible. But because of being able to work with the governments, we were able to reach out to many parts of India. And as on date, even during the COVID time, we are conducting workshops for Tripura and Andhra and other places. We have been able to reach out to about 21 states and union territories out of 36. So, you know, as architects, it is possible to, to, to make a difference and in the, in, the, in the learning spaces. We also have tried to engage at multiple levels, not just as, at an, as, as architects, but also at the policy level. So as a result of that, there are the multiple manuals which have been created for dissemination. We have worked with the National Curriculum Framework earlier, uh, with the implementation frameworks of education on how they could look at educational spaces. This is something we did for schools, and we have also worked uh, with the Women and Child Development Ministry to create resources for them for the preschools and the Anganwadis. These are different kinds of resources that we have generated and disseminated for various purposes. Uh, as, as an architectural practice, we, we firmly believe that research is a very important uh, aspect of designing. Uh, and uh, so we have been kind of uh, working on that aspect. Uh, uh, we have been working with different aspects of research and design and in different sectors. Uh, we have been working with the government and development agencies uh, on architectural aspects uh, and also uh, capacity building of architects, training, engineers, administrators, caregivers, teachers and communities for a bit of techno-social role rather than just a technical role. Uh, also, you know, getting into uh, the basics of cost effective construction wherever feasible and possible and planning using and maintaining infrastructure we have been providing policy support and many of these ideas are now part and parcel of the national policy or uh, state level policies in different states uh, gujarat certainly being one of them which has adopted it for the schools uh, <clears throat> and so on uh, we're going to end before we we kind of uh, close our session on one of the other interventions which we have also done uh, which is different from the green building approach uh, but this is again done in schools and in gujarat uh, where most of you are right now uh, we are going to show you a small film which is based on the work that we have done uh, and this has gone out to about 3500 schools uh, across uh, uh, you know the uh, you know, the state and uh, just let's watch the film first Oh, what do you mean? Summer is hot and dry okay. oh, sorry. in the state of Gujarat. Sorry, I think we'll just uh, <coughs> play it. Uh, uh, Taha, can you just help us with the audio for this? Sir, audio is audible. You can continue playing. Uh, we can continue playing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, wonderful. So. Summer is hot and dry in the state of Gujarat in Western India. Despite the scorching heat, there is a flurry of activity in the government upper primary school at Motidao village. The monsoons are expected any day now, and these students are working feverishly with their teachers to tap precious rainwater in their school using an innovative method to do so. Under Gujarat's Green School program, taking care of the environment has been made an integral part of the school curriculum. Student teams have been formed to look after different aspects. Simple environmental solutions are being promoted that can be put into practice by students, teachers, and communities themselves. Green schools create an atmosphere that inspires children to bond with nature. As a result, 
children learn to appreciate the value of conserving biodiversity on the campus. We have 270 type fruity plant species and 10,000 small plants in our nursery. Every morning, the children bring some bird seed from home to feed the variety of birds that roost in their trees. Members of the various teams have been assigned specific responsibilities. At the Kanodar school, the energy team monitors the monthly readings of the school's electricity consumption, while the water team regularly checks on fluoride levels in their drinking water. Members of the school managing committee then follow up on issues that the students are unable to resolve at their level. Students learn to monitor their environment and implement simple solutions. In the process, they develop a hands-on understanding of the basic concepts of science, maths and social science that are taught in school. For example, air ventilators keep classrooms cool when summer temperatures soar. The ventilators are simple, low-cost appliances that don't need electricity to run. In fact, they help conserve it. Students also learn how buildings can be constructed to make the best use of natural lighting and ventilation. Their concepts are clear and planning of solutions accurate. <laughs> Traditional practices are also being revived to make effective use of resources. After lunch, children save water by scrubbing their plates with sand to remove the grease. This is followed by one quick rinse. The result, precious water is saved and the plates are sparkling clean. The children take these lessons home as well, teaching their parents to be more environmentally conscious. <laughs> The Green School Movement is helping create a new generation of children who respect and protect the environment around them. एक दिन ऐसा आएगा कि जब बच्चा बड़ा हो जाएगा तो उसका व्यवहार वेतन आम लोगों से ज्यादातर चेंज होगा और उसकी एक पर्सनालिटी भी अलग होगी तो उसके दिमाग में हवा क्या है ऊर्जा क्या है जमीन क्या है बिल्डिंग क्या है उसके साथ हमें कैसे व्यवहार करना है वो तो इम्पोर्टेंट है So, uh, you know, to kind of conclude, uh, what we would like to say is that uh, building has a lot and the space has a lot to offer. 
and uh, it's very important that when we are trying to make the best use of available resources for our schools uh, or anganwadis we engage with this whole idea of child development in a, and we create meaningful experiences and memories for children uh, the other is that to to actually make the whole change you have to engage with the ecosystem so rather than designing everything ourselves we did design a lot ourselves but we also made it transparent for others to follow and created an ecosystem where these kind of things can happen and uh, you know it can be taken forward uh, for it to be owned by the people and the system we also very deliberately created the creative stake of people in that ecosystem some of the examples that you just saw and uh, you know it's very important that when we are looking at sustainability making a green building as such is not good enough it's very important that we empower the children to understand what is green what is sustainable what is important because once they go out in the field when they are actually grown up they have they will have a different perspective to the whole thing and that is exactly what uh, we are trying to do uh, in uh, what you see in that small film thank you so much and uh, we are grateful for this opportunity to share and uh, uh, you know be with all of you we are open to any questions that you may have and and i would just end it here thank you so much now the webinar is open for the round of question and answer if anyone has any question they can uh sir uh, there is a questions in a chat box uh, from the vaishnavi konde uh, uh, first is can we use building as a learning aid concept in the education building apart from the school mm. uh, can you repeat the question again can we use building as a learning aid concept in the other education building apart from the school yes of course i even architecture schools uh, or uh, i mean there have been requests to us about uh, you know looking into even higher education institutions where uh, you know they felt that this is something which is required even there so uh, i won't say that it is restricted only to this of course when you have to link it with the curriculum uh, and that is the critical part uh, it has to be useful from the curricular and the learning perspective that uh, is uh, there so uh, you know the individual schools and educational institutions may have different kinds of uh, learning processes and bala will have to be adapted to do, to that actually learning needs of uh, uh, children or people you know in different age groups are different also so what uh, you saw today was meant for more for elementary schools means class 1 to 8 for even if we have to do it for aganwadi we have to reinterpret it as per the needs of children of you know that age group 3 to 6 um and for and again uh, if you do it for university students or higher secondary students we will have to just you know align it to their needs their curriculum and all that even in fact when we have worked with either private schools or with the state, different state governments it had to be adapted to their curriculum and their needs so uh, you know there is no uni universal one thing which can uh, you know be applied and multiplied everywhere so we also suggest a framework within which many of these ideas can be taken forward rather than a standardized design Sir, the second question is: As we know, the government is not good in the maintaining the simple building. Then how will it maintain the original concept? Will it be the same after the ten years? Um, I, I would just like to answer that. You know, even uh, before I started working uh, with the government, even I had a lot of stereotyped and biased and prejudiced ideas about. um you know government and uh, but uh, and i thought that you know everyone uh, government mein kya hota hai kya karte hain but my um this perspective has really changed over the years and there are many many individuals you know whatever we have shown you 
like i've reiterated it again and again that it was not done by us it was it has been done by uh, uh school principals you know and these are our government school principals so uh, it's not as if you know things will not be taken care of and if you are able to build ownership their ownership in the process that is why uh, the process of implementation is very important and if you are able to build in that ownership they do take care and they not only they take care i mean they do wonders and they are very innovative and uh, they have a lot of potential i think uh, uh, and so we should stop looking at them with uh, uh, this kind of a biased approach i would also like to add here and i would just share you uh, share with you a brief example from odisha and we were working in one of the tribal districts of koraput in odisha and uh, you know there were these sarvashiksha abhiyan engineers and uh, we were to develop this tire playground kind of thing there was uh, the the film of which you saw a while ago and uh, i was very worried that you know in that tribal area there was no electricity and there were no metal workshops nearby and how are we going to do it now what happened was that while we were having this uh, entire discussion uh, with the set of people there uh, one of the things that happened was that uh, you know we invited a local person from the community to come and join us and uh, help us in you know looking at the things so i was having this discussion with the ssa engineer about uh, you know making the entire playground with the metal pipes and other stuff and how are we going to do the welding of this and how are we going to fix all this stuff and the nuts and bolts of all this because there's no electricity so, in that particular you know village it was so remote so the engineer told me no no don't worry we will get get the generator and we are going to get uh, the welding machine here so don't worry we'll do everything whatever you want we'll do everything i said no but i'm interested in knowing that how are you going to maintain it tomorrow when there something gets broken then who is going to bring this uh, welding machine and the generator and who is going to pay for it so it will never happen now you won't believe this discussion was happening and a, a local person from the tribal area uh, who we had invited to make the herbal uh, garden in the same school he was overhearing this entire conversation and he came and walked to us and he said can i suggest something so i said okay yeah tell us what is it he said can we not do everything in bamboo so i said well of course but uh, who will do it he said don't worry we will do it and he came up with a solution to i have the video clips of that but we don't have time to share it in and then i asked him but uh, how much time and you know what all will you need he said i don't need to go anywhere i just need to go to the jungle next door and i will do everything and uh, if you give me one or one or two hours i will make the first bamboo swing for you right here and i said okay but uh, how about the cost part of it and he said well it will mean just about uh, 65 rupees and i said 65 rupees and uh, so he said yes 65 rupees and that only to you know get something from the uh, depot uh, the forest depot to get some uh, some stuff you won't believe in next one and a half hours he created that bamboo swing which had no urban material it had no hardware fitting no rope no nail no hardware stuff which will need to come from anywhere and as a result of this what happened was that uh, you know he created and it worked and it really you know was doing wonders there and uh, then i had a very stupid question uh, as i so see it now today to ask this gentleman who created this wonderful uh, you know uh, thing uh, right there and i asked him that agar ye toot gaya to isko maintain kaise karenge so he looked at me and laughed and he said how much did you spend i said 65 rupees and he said how much time did it take for me to create the whole thing so i said one and a half hour he said what do you think if it breaks will it take that much time or uh, even that much money and we can do all this so don't worry about it that's the the thing is there and we'll take care of it so you know that is the spirit when you allow people that ownership that is the spirit with which they all kind of engage and that takes care of this problem so the question is valid i am very much happy to say that yes the question is valid but how we approach it in the process of designing and developing it is where the crux of the matter is so the third question from the same participant is i had read on the internet that you are working on the blind school also is it true if so would like to know the the topic too 
okay i don't know from where uh, in internet this information has really come we have certainly worked with the bpa in ahmedabad and we worked on the inclusive bala uh, where uh, bpa was one of the partners and this was long back uh, about 7 8 years ago and uh, inclusive bala which is meant for children with the special, uh, special needs very more specifically ch children with visual impairment children with the uh, 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 intellectual impairment hearing impairment and physical impairment we had uh, tried to develop bala ideas so that they can we can create inclusive settings uh, i mean you understood the you must have understood the idea of settings uh, in the presentation so how do we create them as inclusive settings where all uh, uh, you know children can be together to do an activity so yes bpa uh, the blind people's association was very much part of it uh but right now we don't have a direct association as of as on now and at that time mr bhushan konani who was the the director of that was uh, the gentleman behind uh, this collaboration so but there are many ideas which were developed in the process sir the ne next question from the ayush birla is uh sir and ma'am how do you look after the implementation part of the bala i think that is the most critical part in the uh, entire process yes it is and uh, ayushi uh, what we would like to say is that uh, uh, you know the implementation happens in multiple stages and uh, you know we shared with you the slide on attitude about uh, you know child friendly attitude so uh, there are three four steps that we we typically take and i'll give you the example of gujarat in this case so uh, you know the first step is where we invite all of them together their administrators their education people their special needs people their engineers their architects if they have any architects and so on and oh, and the and the uh, finance and accounts people also we also invite even their legal people so that they are all together and they understand what the concept is all about and this is important because this is a interdisciplinary concept engineers alone or architects alone cannot take it forward administrators alone cannot take it forward so you need a collaborative of all the finance people are important because they don't even understand sometimes if they don't know what the idea is that what is to be done on the ground so we call all of them for the initial orientation to understand the ideas and this is very critical and important stage and at this stage we also ask all of them after the workshop to go back home and do some homework and this homework is difficult different for different people uh, you know to to kind of uh, uh, do different things so administrators will be asked that now you go back and think about that if you have different boxes of uh, you know uh, uh, um, departments how do these departments talk to each other you work out a situation for that we tell the educationists that think about what are the things which can happen in collaboration with the physical space designing team or the team which is going to take up the technical side of actually making things or maintaining things or upgrading things so that's the second part then we also ask the special needs people to contribute because those children are very much part of the whole process and they need to be engaged in this so we ask all of them to be together and work as a team and this after this homework we move on to the next stage where we our we have a team of pedagogues and curriculum developers who go through their own curriculum the state's curriculum or the school's curriculum to understand the nitty gritties of uh, what can go and what cannot go now this process is an ongoing one and it goes on for a while and then we finalize what all ideas can go to the system now with in this all process like for instance in case of gujarat they said that we don't have uh the schedule of rates for instance for uh, you know executing these items so we said fine so can we create a schedule of rates and you won't believe we would work day and night in gandhinagar to actually create a schedule of rates and that schedule of rate is replicable even today so those schedule of rates includes all child friendly items of work which the government accepts today and those are made uh, on the ground so you know these kind of nitty gritties are all uh, uh, worked out and based on these finally the actual design uh, and the process takes place so yes it's a uh, it's a process which involves multiple steps uh, we have just told you in brief and thereafter 
once we uh, we also train them hands on the engineers so we actually take up few sites where we work hands on with them we also do hands on workshop with teachers and our pedagogy team actually works with the teachers on how to utilize these and also with children so you know there are multiple levels at which this training and the engagement goes for the entire implementation process to take form sir there are too many appreciate in not uh, in the text uh, there is a from the pallavi mahida priti chauhan uh, varsha li mahendra then uh, pyub energy avni thakkar rajni uh, rajni taneja uh, k gardner ashwin mukul sangvi ayushi and uh, swasti jain ayush birla all are given the uh, for the appreciate notes oh thank you thank you so much uh, yes bansi Uh, if anyone has missed any of our webinars, can check to the uh, YouTube channel and they can subscribe there for update for the upcoming webinar. Not the least, I would like Professor Sailesh Patel to give the vote of thanks. Uh, I thank Architect Abir Bajpai and Dr. Priti Bajpai for the sparing their valuable time for this extremely insightful session. It was a pleasure to have you, sir and ma'am. I am extremely thankful to all the attendees for being a part of this webinar and making it the successful. I would thank our principal, Professor Sailas Nair, sir, for his exemplary support and uh, encouragement. Thank you, Mantri, for the hosting uh, today's webinar. Last but most important, I extend my hearty. Uh, Attitude to my fellow mates and the technical team with Professor Taha Padrawala, Professor Garbit Nayak, Professor Deep Gandhi, and Architect Prithuraj uh, uh, Purani, and uh, 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 Prayas Patel, who are working day and day out for this webinar. Thank you, everyone. I would request Kailesh Nair sir and Pallavi ma'am to say a few words. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, Pallavi madam, you can speak first. Yes, sir. I am really overwhelmed uh, by the presentation and uh, Pri uh, Priti and Kabir. It is really a great piece of information for me that uh, in the twenty years where we have not been together, or maybe thirty years, you have worked so much in Gujarat. and we all so nicely connected to all your explanations and i sincerely feel that students get inspired by your presentation right and sir now uh, uh, nair sir you can uh, speak sir please uh, yeah it has given a new insight to the students i hope they will try to put it in their academics also one more thing which i want to tell you is uh, i think lot of guests from outside our college is there so tomorrow we are coming up with our e magazine launching of e magazine i request pallavi madam madam to send the links to them so that yes, they can sir. come uh, be, uh, join us for this event yes sir sir i have got many classmates about 10 to 15 classmates and okay. even from us people have joined sir so entire launching will be done through online mode only and the entire magazine will be launched in online mode so this is the first time we are doing it every time we used to print and give it to everybody but this time we are doing it in through e magazine so i request all the guests who has come from outside to join us tomorrow at uh, elon o'clock the link will be sent by pallavi madam to your group yes thank you yes sir thank you so much and thank you abhir and priti uh, congratulations professor nayar for the e launch Uh, it's a huge, you know, back-end uh, work, uh, you know, that goes into such an um, endeavor. So I wish you all the success also, and uh, thanks for inviting us. Uh, yeah. it, it's always good to reach out to students, and uh, so thanks uh, all of you to, you know, for hosting us for this lecture. And my dear apologies for extending the time that uh, you may have. Oh, that uh, is okay. It's our pleasure, sir. <laughs> 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 
And, yes. Uh, and we are really grateful to all of you for uh, inviting and giving us an opportunity to share. And uh, I, I would like to thank uh, all of you uh, for uh, giving time uh, to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm closing the meeting. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.